Hey, and welcome to another episode of Creative Leaders Unplugged, a podcast brought to you by Future Skills Academy. I'm Morgan uh, with Arna, and today we're talking to Tiz Creel. She is an, an, what does she call herself? Artist. She's an artist. She's an yeah. artist. Uh, struggling <laughs> with the words, though. Sorry, what? A questioning artist, a, a maker, a breaker, an undisciplined artist. Yeah, a breaker, um, and someone who questions everything, um, trying to find her way. Um, uh, very interesting because of that. Because of that, yeah, I, I want to say struggle. I'm not sure if it's a struggle, but it, there is a struggle there in the sense of uh, where do I belong? What 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 is it that who what am I? Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm an artist. I've always considered myself an artist. Uh, but I don't like the world of art. I don't like the way artist is 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 being seen or the way it's kind of uh, so elite elitist. And um, so we, uh, no, that which to me basically is a true artist. That's what an artist should do: question those things. So it, yeah. there's an interesting paradox there, where she actually wants to distance herself from the world of art, but by doing that, to me, she's a real artist because sure. that's what you're supposed to be doing. I don't, yeah, and and also, you know, she starts saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a maker, I'm a breaker, and uh, and that's exactly what she's doing. And I, so it gave me a lot of uh, inspiration and energy, and and, and uh, I'm like, I want to be an artist now too. I have four <laughs> posted full of inspiration from this convo. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really I really love the way uh, she also was able to articulate things really. I mean, yeah. she, clearly she she's very smart. Mm -hmm. And she really thought about this, and you know, she wrote this article. We're going to share that also, um, you know, alongside yes. this, this, this yeah. podcast. Very philosophical, also in a way. And I hope I, for me, I mean, I've spent time studying the difference between art and design. There were also some points, and I was like, oh, I hadn't considered that angle of it before. So yeah, mm. yeah, she's yeah, she lives it. She's in this, and that's the other feeling I got. She's in like in the middle of it. Right. It's not a it's, in, it's not just a reflecting on it, like uh, in hindsight. No, it's like she's mm -hmm. right there now. And yeah. uh, right. so you felt you felt the sort of the passion, but also the frustration and also the sort of the, the yeah, you know, trying to find meaning in, in it and looking at what what can we do? Should we do something? No. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, we have to break this thing, you know, and uh, but is it our role to do it? And uh, no, I, 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 it really got me. Um, I, yeah. Really excited. So, yeah. yeah. And I knew I knew Tiz from before. And she's she's somebody who every time I talk that we have a conversation, it just has me looking at things in new ways. And I think that's such a such an incredible skill to have. That's yeah. something that I, you know, an everyday thing, art, right? Like, oh, art, you automatically know. No, you don't automatically know what that means, uh, especially after yeah. this conversation. So. Yeah, words, um, yeah. words, yeah. And if you, you know, if you, if you, yeah, if, if you turn it upside down and you look at it from a different angle, you go like, what exactly does it mean? You know, yeah. isn't it all the same? I and mean, why do we have these words and these boxes that we kind of, assign people to and and how you know because yeah exactly so i love that and that so so exactly what she said uh that she was a maker and a breaker um that is what she did yeah yeah okay enjoy be inspired i think i am a lot of things i am a creative i'm a maker i'm a breaker <laughs> i live by imagination uh, I'm an undisciplined artist, I would say. That's because I never uh, settled in a medium or a conceptual frameworks. And I was told many, many times uh, to focus on something as an artist. Uh, and that's kind of the way to success. Then I, uh, for the good, the bad, and the worst, I chose not to define it as a, my practice. Uh, and I just started a studio, which is a exper experiential uh, design and play studio. And we essentially uh, create experiences and resources uh, to challenge, inform, or inspire people in different subjects. So my first, uh, when you started saying uh, you're a maker and a breaker, I thought, so my question is, what do you break? Well, I guess... 
sometimes to make you have to break. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have something that it's already uh, done, it's already in its final form. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you you have to break it to make it evolve. If that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah, it's, it's like opening a, a fridge, you know, and see what's the inner connections and how it works. Or it, it, it's a bit of the same principle. Sometimes to find out novel things or to experiment, you have to break things. You have to open things up metaphorically or, or physically. Yeah, for sure. I, it reminds me a little bit of when I was a kid, by the way. My my parents had these old radios uh, in the... And so beautiful. I think they it was from their parents or my you know my great grandparents or something. Was, I I don't know if they were valuable or anything, but at one point I would uh, I was so curious about what would what was inside of these things. Uh, so I I did kind of put them pull them apart, and <laughs> the problem is I couldn't get them back together again. That's sort of the the, the only <laughs> downside of this story is like I, I wasn't able to actually get it, but it, but it did kind of. But it, it is about that curiosity and imagination. And at the same time, to your point, um, you know, uh, uh, if, if you break something. So I think to me, creativity is about um, creating new connections. Um, uh, creativity is about um, not coming up with new things. Nothing's ever new, but it's new connections, right? So you put it back together again in a different way. You go like, huh, but it creates a different meaning. But the thing is the same. And I... I think I saw a, something that you created uh, somewhere on, online, and it was one of those, how do you call those little uh, um, castles uh, made of, um, how do you, can you kind of- A bouncy castle. Bouncing oh. castle, is that the name? Or an yeah. inflatable. Uh... Inflatable, yeah, right. So, you know, something that you typically my, 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 when my kids were still smaller, they would kind of play in these kind of inflatable castles thingies right just you kind of uh, jump it down so is that something as an example that you know what you were um talking about that you because it's yeah can you talk us through that a little bit yeah because it absolutely. interested me because of the visual of it and the, also the it was taken out of context because you go like oh that's for kids oh no it's not for kids is it for kids oh maybe it is i don't know <laughs> you know i I like to break those barriers to who are these things for, no? These things are for whoever wants to experience them. And that's a way that I try to manage my work. But it's true that sometimes, and I have noticed this over and over again, when there is something that is interactive in any kind of context, if a child or children or a young person is using it, playing it, or... Uh, doing what not in that space, the adults will never engage. But if the kids are not in the space, they can engage. It's an interesting uh, mm -hmm. behavioral thing that I have noticed uh, throughout time that adults immediately think, oh, if a child is using it, then it's not for me. Uh, and it has happened many times with my work, but also I have noticed that in, in any cultural space where there's interactive experiences and whatnot. Uh, but I, that's a side note uh, about the Bouncy Castle. Uh, it was a project that I made in 2019, I believe. And I wanted to design a structure that it was fully immersive. Uh, when you go inside, there's no way out somehow. no. And I thought about many formats that I could take, but also in the part of creating it a way that uh, something that I could reuse, that I could recycle. So there were a lot of things that uh, played a part on why I chose that to be an inflatable. But it it came to be, and the whole plan was to, to design a bouncy castle that it's made for you to fall down. Mm. You no, know? so there's holes on the on the ground. The stairs are very narrow. So when you try to climb them, you immediately slip down. And there's a series of details that we included on that structure. And the idea was exactly that. No, I want adults to go in and try to behave like adults normally and being unable to because they go in the hole, they cannot climb, they cannot do anything. So either or you let yourself down and just stay where you are completely immobile, or you actually move and engage and 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 play. Uh, so it was a way to force people a little bit to 
uh, to play. I didn't tell them, of course, that it was designed for that. It was more about like go in and you make your own your own stories there. And then mm -hmm. I have used the structure uh, to create other experiences as the anchor or the hook, perhaps to create stories, for example. Uh, in the creative sense or the or the learning or the academic environment, sometimes I've done uh, different explorations. And yeah, you can always use these assets, these pieces as a way to to start conversations. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you say yeah, you're you're a breaker, uh, this is a great example of how you also break sort of um you break up sort of the normal, the normal way of behaving you force people into a sort of a behavior that, you know, that they, you know, they don't choose, but they have to because they're in your design. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's, uh, um, it's really, it's an interesting way of thinking about it because I think breaking things is also seen as making uh, a mistake, you know, right. Mm -hmm. So it's not supposed to happen, you know, it's supposed to break things, but actually to your point, if you can't break them and you know, you'll Wait. never, yeah, you can never come up with anything new, right? So, and some things have to be broken. You know, there's many systems and many uh, conceptions or concessions, social concessions in which we operate every day that maybe we do need to break. Mm. Uh, we cannot really build upon them anymore. You know, things that could be damaging to others or to certain groups and communities, mm -hmm. the environment, you call it. No, there's many things that as a society we need to break in our well, behavior and the things that we do and yeah but is it, it also not a, an, an intervention into it to to understand things better if you an intervention is also you know in a way your your bouncy castle is also an intervention where all of a sudden all the rules don't apply uh the normal way of you would you know the way you should behave or want to behave or and all of a sudden but it does kind of unearth basically all the whatever the norms are what normal is and because it's this great intervention so i think that that in a way that turns it into art as well because I, to me great artists are, are artists and art is all about intervention where you go like huh you know that makes me uncomfortable or or makes me think or is a comment on something or you know it, it breaks to your point it breaks a pattern and it's an intervention into something, which is so. I don't know that. So I'm sorry. I'm gonna like because I love that word breaking, because yeah. we feel so awkward about that when actually there is to your point there is no other way. Yeah, and you called yourself an undisciplined artist in the beginning, and that's right. So I think that's really fabulous because that's always a bit the the narrative right oh you're an artist okay what's your medium what's your specialty what's your you know and so for yourself as you've chosen to explore different mediums and doing things do you find that there's a red thread through what you're doing even though it's in different yeah formats yeah I mean there there might be a few things that could be a common thread but I always say if I have to choose a medium it would be play hmm which makes it even more, more difficult, probably. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, throughout the years, I have explored so many different mediums. Uh, I started painting, but throughout I've done sculpture, digital arts. I have worked with machine learning. I have worked with resins, with metal, with wood, with textiles. And... The nature of my work really has more to do with what it is or what is meant to be more than I'll translate whatever it is to the medium that I know uh, or I have mastered. No, And that brings very positive things or a lot of value, but it also has a downside and it becomes very difficult to, to be or exist as an artist when you don't really have any definition or to find opportunities or... Uh, to just get seen so there is a part and it's funny because the art the arts and art is supposed to break boundaries and is supposed to be always at the forefront of uh, the revolutionary ideas and transformational processes and whatnot and it doesn't really feel like 
it does that, or at least it doesn't anymore. And the, the meaning of art, which is very, very interesting because you said, well, for me, art for me means this, no? And mm. it's funny because it is for you. There is no definition of art that everyone can agree with the, or that really encompasses what art is or what it's yeah. supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. So it is a very interesting subject. In the in the end, it has to do more with the with with the context. I feel uh, you know, art means different things in different times for different people in different places, and depending on where you yeah. are, is basically temporal and contextual. Mm. Yeah, and it's in the eye of the beholder. Exactly. And, yeah. So and I we've. Um, so, so Morgan and I, we actually had, you know, we had lots of conversations around, and we also had a podcast about this, about, you know, art, um, out, art, being an artist or a designer or what's the difference. And when can you actually say about yourself that you're an artist? Because it almost sounds like a lofty thing. Like I am an artist when actually most are artists, <laughs> no, it's nothing lofty about it. Cause they're just, you know, they, they can't even make a living. Because it because through their art, so there's nothing lofty about it, but somehow there's something when you say I'm an artist. There's, you know, I think it's I think there's something very brave about it, right? Because mm. it's such a risk, right? Because it can yeah. mean so many different things to so many different people. Because I might see one thing in this painting, and you might see the complete opposite. Yeah, it's I think it's really a you know a yeah. yeah. It's brave because it's vulnerable and it's scary yeah. and it's uh, because you create something to your point is that, you know, um, you know, you know, you're, you, you see something and you create something um, with an intention and then other people can go like, nah, nah, yeah. but it's such a, because people, when you create, when you're creative, creative and an artist specifically, you create something from your own mind and you, you know, that's very close to your heart. That's very vulnerable too. So you have to be really brave to show it to people because people can go like, nah, that's really terrible. <laughs> like, oh. but that's my, that's my personal, uh, also feeling like, so as a creative and, uh, and also as an artist, <laughs> which I, um, you know, for me, uh, that's always been such a, um, scary thing. And when I work with designers also, uh, there's this vulnerability there. You know, they don't, they want to be liked. They want to be kind of seen as professionals and, uh, and, and doing their craft really well. And also, and at the same time, and this is all, you know, inside their own heads without anybody else's judgment, you know, even before that happens, they're inside of them. They're full of doubts and thoughts and like, is this good enough? Is this okay? You're comparing themselves to others. You know, so being, you know, being yourself and saying, no, this is, this is what I want and making your own choices. And I think that's what you're kind of describing that people say, no, you have to focus. You know, if you don't focus, you're never going to be successful. <laughs> you're like, that's not me. And it's true. <laughs> well, I, well, it's I'm bear witness of that. Is it, <laughs> There is a lot of, uh, yeah, rejection to to different things within the art sector, I think. but. In, there might be many things at play that 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 is why that happens. Mm -hmm. But are you I an artist a, or a designer? Sorry, you. I wanted. To, sorry, you have to fin finish that sentence. Uh, I I wrote an article. Uh, I we can share later on. It's called the art conundrum, and he, I talk about the art world. I talk about what it means or what it is to be an artist today, mm -hmm. and. A little bit on the philosophical side of the meaning and the purpose of art today or to redefine an invitation to redefine what art mm -hmm. is in somehow so i'll share it to you mm -hmm. and yeah, you might read and you tell me what you think but it is really a dilemma no there's a lot of uh, incongruencies and oppositions with it, what art is or what it can do and what is not no, anyone can be an artist or artist is the sole genius, no? And there's a lot of dichotomies that rise within when you question yourself what art is and what is it for. And, and you realize how there is no agreement 
into what that is. Maybe there was agreements in different agreements throughout time of what art was. No, for the Greeks, it was something more technical, for example, mm -hmm. like a technical ability. At some point, it was more about aesthetics, and another point, it was more about a form of communication. But if you think about today, what is the purpose of art today? What is the influence today of art? And it really, you get to a point where you think, does it have any influence in society nowadays? Because you think about who are the cultural makers or who are the people who are, let's say, winning the cultural wars yeah. uh, today. And you, you look at, you know, pop stars, you look at reality show uh, stars, you look at other people, but really, the, where are the artists today? And where is the influence? Where is the value of what artists do for society? It seems to me that at some point, the art world enclosed on itself mm -hmm. and yeah, it became somehow of a bubble. No, So there, sometimes you do have to question the structure that is behind it. That is also about uh, something about breaking. No, uh, because arts, artists and art is always going to exist with or without the industry. And there's always going to be people who are making things and who are creating new things and making aesthetic creations or being amazing in a technical ability or create new forms of communicating that are novel. There's always going to be people like that. There's always going to be creatives in the world. No, but art, it's... It's an interesting question to say if art has any any purpose today, yeah, any function. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So interesting. I, or uh... if should have, if should it should it yeah. have a function? Yeah. And I I watched a kind of a cultural side side tangent, but connected. I watched so last night was a Super Bowl, which for those not a, as familiar with American football is the the moment for the biggest. TV advertisements of the year. So people are paying millions upon millions of dollars to have 60 seconds of airtime because they know that a large majority of people in the United States are watching television during the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. so of course, I watched the Super Bowl commercials uh, today during lunch to catch up and see, okay, what was the, you know, what were the big commercials? Hey, so did you watch the Super Bowl? No, just the commercials. <laughs> you just watched the commercials. Okay, sorry. You, go. you just went to watch Taylor Swift. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but the but the commercials were so, um, yeah, it was really interesting because you. I I remember growing up watching the commercials and they would. And of course, I was five or seven or eight, so my judgment was a bit different. But you know, you you read them as one thing, and now it's become something completely different. And it's really about who's the biggest celebrity we can pull into this mm. these sixty seconds, so they can hold our product in their hand and say, "Buy this." And it's yeah. it was it was missing so many of the commercials that I watched where there was no there was no art to it. And it made it, but then there were a few that really stood out and it, you could feel the difference. And it, it just really blew my mind that so much as effort is going into, you have the attention of a large segment of the nation and you not even using it to the biggest potential that it had. And it was, yeah, it was really surprising to me. This is a tangent. We I live in the influencers. <laughs> uh, no, but it's it's the influencers uh, economy uh, we live in, which I think is not. I mean, and I, I don't know this. Obviously, I didn't. Do, I didn't do any research in this, but I've been reading up on this, and mm -hmm. um, it. You know, a lot of the influence of influencers is actually uh, not that big at all. Um, mm -hmm. So they don't really have that much influence. Basically, influencers are people who. Uh, connect themselves to a product that is already starting to become popular, but it's popularized in networks, in communities and networks, um, mm -hmm. and not through 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 influencers. Uh, but uh, they basically can give it a little bit of a push. Sure. Um, but we have this belief that uh, that uh, we, you know we need these big names and these famous people and these kind of voices uh, to be heard. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating. Um, yeah, what I mean, the question is, what is art? I mean, art is 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 you know is you know is there art involved? Uh, there are designers involved, right? In all these programs and all these things, mm -hmm. and designers and design is everywhere. Everything is designed, in a way, by people. Yeah. It's created. So there's an it's interesting. So so my so that's what I wanted to ask you that question because we've been kind of struggling with this kind of 
question a little bit. I mean, I think we have an answer for it, but not really sure where the boundaries are. But are you a designer or are you an artist? And where is that kind of, where does it kind of overlap? Or During my entire life, I have considered myself an artist. And recently, a few years back, I started calling myself a designer as well. And I use them sometimes one, sometimes the other, depending on the context, because I find that sometimes I need to help people to define myself. So mm. if I say too many things, it might just like, okay, I'm a designer or okay, I'm an <laughs> artist. And it makes it a bit easier for me to mutate because I use both tools. I use design to make art and yeah. I can make art of design sometimes as well. It, and it really depends, no? Uh, but when I am doing something that has a function and that function is, is more important than anything else, then I consider that I am designing. So for example, in the Bouncy Castle, that was a work of art. I think that what I did the most was to design. And I had to because those kind of structures could be very, very dangerous and people can get hurt or people can yeah. die, you know, and there has been yeah. many accidents throughout the the history of bouncy castles where people really? have I never died. thought yeah. about that. They died in bouncy castles. Yeah. That history, it's Arna, such yeah. an awkward death. Yeah. It's wow. a very never, bizarre thing, but because they're inflatable structures, uh, there's many things that can happen, no? But one of them, it can be that if you don't attach it properly to the ground or you don't put enough weights and a good uh, wind comes, as you know, that you're in the uh, right. Netherlands. Yeah. It uh, can take it and it can lift it up for many, Your many meters. And air. that has happened already multiple okay, times. And there's a big scary. famous case, yeah, of an artist's work, actually, that it was an inflatable. It wasn't a bouncy castle because you enter to a space, but... It, the space was, uh, you, you didn't, you were not lifted from the ground mm -hmm. and they didn't attach it properly. It wasn't a field in the UK and then it lifted up and it injured, I don't know how many people and two oh, people really? died. Uh, it was very, it was a, a shocking case, but yeah, they're surprisingly dangerous. And of course I didn't knew that when I decided to do the project because I never think about like the little nitty grits. I, I think, okay, this has to be a bouncy castle and I decided on it and this is what it's going to be. And then you figure out those little details, but as more, the more you, you dig into the subject, you actually realize how complicated it is. I needed uh, permissions. I needed to test the materials like fire testing and, and I have to have Every year I have to test them. Every I have to get insurance. If, for example, a child cannot go inside with an adult because if they're jumping and they crash, they can injure, the child can get injured or they can go out flying. There's so many little details that These you would never imagine. Dangerous contraptions. <laughs> I, I'm so happy my kids survived because they've been in many of them. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's I, fine. I... <laughs> the people who run them, they know what they're doing because they have to be certified. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But 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 then again, I mean, is that is that part of design is or is that just part of I mean, that sounds like you need some you need some engineering. Absolutely. Uh, right. And so that's an engineer uh, that that goes into the like the details of the of uh, or it's, you know, of, of, of yeah. the safety and the, and the, the, the you know, materials and, the, you know, of course, there's a there's design there, too. But, but also I... there are sorry. Yeah. Well, because and because I teach, you know, industrial design engineering. So we're also playing a lot with the difference between design and engineering. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your bouncy castle tis that you had like a very narrow staircase that would mm -hmm. cause them to move their body, you know, maybe like be hunched over or something, right? Yeah, well, the stairs particularly, they will make you fall because as soon as you step on them, they're so narrow that and because it's an inflatable structure it's not completely mm -hmm. solid. So there's almost no way there is like techniques that you can develop of course yeah. but essentially there is no way that you can just completely put your all your weight on on one of the steps so eventually you have you kind of go down of course it's possible and people do whatever they can to 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 climb the stairs and they do but uh yeah it was but a conscious decision yeah, and I and this to me sounds like especially with these stairs, and that's just one small part of the whole the whole project, you know, like that there would be okay design. Let's have them and kind of the art, right? Like we're gonna have them kind of struggle on the staircase, and then the engineering. How do I actually 
manuf- not manufacture, but how do I bring, build this and bring this to life? And uh, yeah, well, for me, art, and I can, I can start with defining what I, I think, or what art is to me, you know, so to me is the ability to ideate uh, beyond what is presented. No, so let's say that you're a shoemaker mm-hmm. and you're always every day making the same shoes according to these patterns and that's what you do. And then one day you decide to do something different, to improve it, to experiment with it, to learn from it, uh, to make it unusable. To, it, it doesn't really matter what you do, but that intuition mm-hmm. to me is what makes the artist. No, uh, so is to imagine something that doesn't exist, to create something that doesn't exist, or to even, you know, ambition it. You don't, sometimes you don't have to create it. It could be a story that would never occur. Mm. Uh, And I guess an artist would be someone that lives by that intuition, but that intuition perhaps could come to anyone at any time. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. But this is a personal perspective of what I think I mm-hmm. consider what art is to me, no? Yeah. So I have stripped a little bit uh, the the quality of genius or the quality of master that artists always have. And I just mm. put them in a place of saying, like, just think outside the box. And that's that should be enough. So, just try. So if you would have asked, uh, so I'm just going, going with this uh, kind of theme a little bit. <laughs> no. So... If you would have asked uh, someone like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, are you a designer, an artist, an engineer, a scientist? <laughs> Choose which one. Which one are you? Architect? You know what are you? I would you? say an artist because of all of those things. Yeah, but I, I I think somehow we at that time when he was that there was no that had no meaning. There was no there was so. Artist maybe, but the designer, the, the 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 whole concept of a designer wasn't there yet. Um, and so, and being an engineer and and being sort of a scientist mm-hmm. in that sense, um, you know, breaking things and putting them back together again, uh, and imagining things that are not there, and and then just trying to make them come alive, et cetera, et cetera. I think that I think it's a very, um, and, you know, maybe you know more about this and maybe someone who's listening knows more about this and please do kind of correct me if I'm wrong. But I think that it's quite a current modern way. And I'm saying modern in a kind of broad sense of word, like, you know, maybe the last what hundred years, 200 years that we started to see sort of designers as a bubble and artists as a bubble and engineers as a bubble and science as a bubble, because yeah. basically the way we think about things and solve problems is the same. Um, the reason why we are doing it might be different. So an artist might just do things because the artist has this urge to do something, but there's no client saying, we want you to create this thing, uh, right? And we're going to pay you for it. And it has to look a little bit like this or something. You know, there's commission art. I mean, obviously. So there's, there's, there's kind of, it's not a, you know, I don't think these bubbles are something real. I think a lot of people like yourself, I think a lot of people. We don't fit are, anywhere. No, because you go like, they gave us these boxes, you know, <laughs> but I don't fit in any of these boxes. And if you're smart, you're going to say, well, it's, so this is really interesting. And I've been doing this all of my life. I think, you know, when it's, when it makes sense to say you're a designer, you're a designer. If it makes sense that you're an artist, I'm an artist. If it makes sense that I'm a consultant, I'll be a consultant. You know? It's just a word. Really, it's, it's just, just a, a word. word. It's a word. It makes you comfortable. All right, fine. I'm that. But I'm using the same tools. Mm-hmm. I'm using the same, you know, things that I know and, and I have experience and I have talent for to come up with solutions for you. And um, and I think... But I do think that there's a, a bit of a difference between design and art. Maybe it wasn't be- before and now it is. I always thought about design, as I said before, like with a function, no, and it has to always comply to that function first. No, if you're build, making a building, you have to make sure that the building is safe, that mm-hmm. it's going to last, that it has all the appliances and everything that it needs in that sense. No, if you're making a chair, you have to make sure that it functions as a chair that you can sit on it. Uh, and then 
you can experiment with that. And then after the function is covered, you can experiment with the, with the aesthetics, with the materials, with the design itself, and try to push the boundaries of the design. But art doesn't have those boundaries mm. or is not supposed to have those boundaries or it never has those boundaries. But so what you're even, talking even about is, is a craftsperson. That's craft. Where, where but is a the... craft can have boundaries because if you're making a glass out of yeah. ceramic, yeah. you still need to cover that function. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, I mean, if you're if you if your craft is a, a furniture maker, mm -hmm. right? Are you, I mean, do you do you call are you a designer? Ooh, do you you know, did you made it or you're just replicating it because maybe you are yeah. you know, not everybody's a creator, no? Some people just want to be told what to do and they just want to go in and do it and then go off. No, not everybody has that intuition of I want to see what's beyond this furniture piece. It, and that that urge, just some yeah. people have it, and it's good for the balance of the world community too. You know that we have people that also just want to say, "I don't want to think; just tell me <laughs> just, what to do, and I'll do it, and that's it." You're gonna have those people <laughs> like just do it. All right, fine. Just tell me as what to do, who, please. <laughs> yeah, as someone who fails to um uh to like finish things perfectly or be, be able to bring out the polish, when I was able to come in with the plan and share this with my classmates or my colleagues who are more of the yeah, I don't know, the crafts people, if you will, they were able to say, okay, we see what she wants to do, let's do it. And I would not be able to survive or function without these people. Mm -hmm. I have more of the ideas, but I struggle with all of the fine little details, but they know their craft or they know the material that they're working with so well, they're able to bring that together for me. Exactly. When someone masters a craft, that's when it becomes art, supposedly. No, It's not just knowing how to paint, really, because nowadays anyone can paint uh, with a YouTube tutorial, but mm -hmm. it's about what you do uh, with that technique and how you master that technique. And that's why we used to call artists masters because they used to do yeah, unique things. Exactly. No, uh, Certain painters used to revolutionize the ways we understand painting and, and that's why they get that name. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. But nowadays it's not really like that. And for a very long time, uh, it hasn't been like that. Contemporary art is not about a technical skill or technical ability at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of artists don't even know how to 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 draw properly mm -hmm. in terms of of proportions, light, and and mm -hmm. form. Uh, not necessarily caricatures or whatnot, or having like a distinctive style, but actually be able to copy reality, which is one of the most important skills for an artist, because when you know how to in make an interpretation of the world as it is, then it's mm -hmm. easier then to you break. Can break. Then you can break. Yeah. You, exactly. So I grew up in a family of artists and my, I had a great, a grandfather, my grandfather, my mother, my mother's side of the family are, they're all artists. And uh, so my grandfather was quite a successful artist, quite well known in his time. Um, so he, um, and, and I, this kind of somehow parts of me he, that ruined parts of me or my brain as an artist, because he would say, to your point, um, and, uh, if, if you can't have, if you don't know the craft, if you can't draw, you know, you can go like do abstract painting, but it's meaningless because they can't draw. And so he would kind of judge artists, very famous artists, based on the fact that they, when he saw their drawings, like they can't really draw. So they kind of, they don't have the craft, so they can't really be uh, meaningful at all in their art. Okay. So now I'm, so that has ruined part of my brain because for a long time I would, um, uh, for instance, I would really not like Van Gogh because Van Gogh, to be honest, it's not a really good artist in the sense of real artists uh, being, you know, these crafts people. And there's this wonderful, was a wonderful television program about recreating one of his pieces of art and, um, and underneath his a famous painting, a self-portrait, I think, was a was a painting that he he painted over it, and mm -hmm. it was a um, um, it was a model, uh, sort of a a, a a session with a model when he was at the academy in Antwerp, and um, and they wanted to recreate the painting perfectly, so they also wanted to kind of have first the painting underneath the painting, so the artist that was recreating the painting wanted to first draw that one and then 
do the, uh, the, the famous one on top of it. By the way, as an artist, it, it, you know, if you paint over, it might be because you don't have any money to, for, for the canvas, but uh, maybe you were really embarrassed with, you know, so don't do that anyway. So <laughs> anyway, so they went to the, the uh, academy because they thought, well, that was when he was in the academy and there's this model. And so other artists would have been doing the same kind of model at the same time in the same sitting. So they, they went to the academy to see whether there were other paintings and, you know, from that same, same, same model, same sitting and, um, <laughs> and the work. And they were amazing. They were like photographs. They were so beautiful. So, and the, the one thing that Go made was no. It was like a cartoonish kind of a, no, it wasn't really good. He was kicked out of the academy also, partly because of that, because they were like, he has no talent. Okay. But then what I also discovered later is that because he had, maybe he didn't have the ability to make these kind of photographic, beautiful, you know, lifelike images, but he had a passion. He just went, and because of his inability, he discovered something new. He didn't do the perfect thing. He went beyond that because because he, he had to kind of invent something else to express himself, and he and he couldn't do it the, sort of the classical way. This is my interpretation, by the way, of, of history. Sorry, if anybody <laughs> listening, this is my interpretation. How I because then I were like, actually, I love I love how people who struggle, um, who are maybe not the kind of the picture perfect, who are not the ones that go like, yeah, you're like exactly you can do. You're so talented and, and, and somehow create something that is so uniquely their own mm. because they chose the difficult path and they couldn't do what the others did. And they, you know, the miss, so, because I'm a little bit of a miss with myself. He's like, so isn't that, is there, so yeah. So did he, you know, is that true? And like, and Picasso, you know, to be honest, he's not a really good, you know, if you look at his drawings, yeah, I know people who can do that way better. Yeah. But, and it's a there's a lot of I mean if we go down Van Gogh is a special case I would say no but there is reasons why also the artists got picked as to be the talented ones there were many artists in that time and 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 there's something about reputation there's something about relationships mm, and sure. as mm -hmm. it always has been because art especially and and specifically because it's it doesn't have a performance measurement like any other thing, like design, for example. It does have mm. a performance measurement that would be the function, Good I point. suppose. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you even say what what is art, what is not art? You can tell throughout history certain moments of revolution within art, eh, eh, but which artists got to become famous, that's someone's yeah. choice. Well, totally. And, and uh, hey, Van Gogh never was successful. I mean, he was. Yeah, he, Van Gogh was a special case, I would say, because he truly, he, he didn't, he took, he had a different path than most of all other artists that become famous, e even when they're there. Uh, and yeah. it's because they're tagged along with this group of people, the network, mm. that the correct network to to be pushed in that direction, no? And mm. Locke could also play an important role, but Van Gogh didn't, did never really go through that. So it's an interesting case. Mm -hmm. But also he was an interesting character on its own. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at all... I mean, especially famous artists or any artist, really, if you look at their lives, it's full of, uh, you know, happy accidents or or bad accidents or like, you know, you know, why, why did, why is that, uh, you know, art is so famous and that one is not so famous. And if you look at that world and they were also, you know, just, just human beings. And, uh, and especially in the time of Ingo, well, like in the time of, of Rembrandt, for instance, is really fascinating where basically he has a studio um, in a way, he he is you know he, it's, it's like a design studio. He has all these his his apprentices who kind of you know paint. Yeah, they him. make the paintings, and then he goes and yeah, it's like, like you know. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, which makes sense because it's just it's 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 a, it's a it's a job. It's a studio, and it's like now you go to you know you have your photograph taken, and then you had your photograph painted, and um, um. So I you know my point is a little bit like there's so much. Um, we don't, we, we put things in these bubbles in these boxes and we say, no, this is art and no, 
this is how an artist should be, or no, this is what, what is meaningful or, and we're always looking for that. And I don't mind the looking for it, but I, uh, to your point earlier uh, about the, the art world being sort of a bubble and, and actually being very uh, traditional, I think, and very, um, uh, not very uh, flexible and not very, you know, I, I, to me, you know, every time I, I kind of, I'm going to bump into the art world here in the Netherlands. I go like, huh, this is really weird because they, they act as, I don't know, they're, they're not very open at all. Uh, first of all, you need a diploma. Otherwise, you can't be an artist. So you can't, have a, you can't kind of join a, like an exhibition here in my town, for instance. There's some exhibitions that are really nice, but the only artists that are allowed to show their work are people with a diploma. <laughs> You go like, really? <laughs> That's interesting. At the same time, I understand it because these are working artists and you have to make a living. So they kind of need to kind of protect, protect the market a little bit. But it's fascinating how that uh, kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I have you... another question. I have a, sorry, I have a totally different question um, because <laughs> I want to know when did you start calling yourself an artist? What is the moment in life where you felt that you wanted to be an artist or did you start yeah. And that when, tackles when, my question is, did you always want to be an artist as well? So, Absolutely. I don't know when I, could, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint exactly when I decided, oh, I'm an artist. No, But since I was very young, there were always artistic tendencies. And from the very beginning, I started doing little things like I used to have I created with a, my mom's recorder that she used to go to take classes she used to take our class and record the classes and I used to take that and I did a radio show with a friend I didn't even remember that she told me a few days ago that when we <laughs> did it and I remember now uh, I used to do little short films in in school uh, all sorts of different things and I have always had that uh, intuition to create Mm -hmm. uh, or to do something maybe you know it has to do uh, with uh, ADHD that I have which I didn't knew at the time so I would find that out many years later but at that point I always needed to constantly be stimulating uh, myself and this is the way that I found how to do it somehow mm -hmm. no um, and how I started it uh, per se, uh, it was because I was a bit of a troublemaker, probably from for the same reasons. I was doing bad at school in terms of grades and behavior. And at some point, they sent me to therapy. And in therapy, I always used to draw and doodle and do little things or just scribble. And all the time, every, every single minute that I spend in therapy, I used to do that. So my therapist recommended me with a painter. Uh, so I could learn, and that was the guy who, Javier Gomez Soto, who showed me everything I know about these classical forms of, of, of painting or understanding oh, wow. art. So I came to the, his studio the first day, and I thought I was going to paint right away, and he was going to take out all the oil paints, and, I, and it was going to be fun. And he just gave me a pencil and a piece of paper put an apple in front of me and he said, until you know how to draw that apple perfectly, you will not paint. Oh. And so it happened. It took me, I don't know how much, perhaps like a year or something to master pencil so I can <laughs> move to carbon and then to oil at some point. Oh, this uh, is my grandfather. <laughs> I think it's important, but going yeah, back about is. the skill, you know, if you're a film artist that does filmmaking, maybe you don't need to draw. No, so mm. the problem nowadays is that the lack of definition of art or the lack of understanding of, or agreement on what art is and what it's supposed to do, mm. it's a good thing because it allows anything to be art and anything to be explored or to be redefined and what not, but at the same time, it kills it in the sense that by not defining it, mm. we stop understanding it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And there is a lot of conversations that we can start, and I've been trying to start them to say, should we define something? Should we, you know, it's not about limiting the concept, but it's about having a purpose. And if art would have a purpose nowadays, maybe it could be very useful. 
to fight against all these narratives that are constantly being bombarded at us through social media, through everything is always bombarding us with content and conversations and putting ideas in our head. And it's always constantly feeding, feeding, but no one is really contrasting all of this content. There is no alternative in the content. It is what you get. And there's no one really doing something outside that doesn't have like a, a, a another intention or a secondary or, or like a profound intention to sell or to promote something or to uh, spread fake news or news or what or spread an idea. But everybody has an agenda somehow mm. uh, or something they want to achieve by doing that content. And there is no there is no contrast to that. Yeah, interesting. I uh, I think that art. Um, I add. It makes me think of this. There there, there was a uh, platform um, which uh, closed down. It was called uh, um, Elo or Elo. I don't know how to pronounce that. Elo. Uh, I was pronouncing it Hello. Uh, and uh, it it, um, it was a platform that promised at the beginning to be um, advertisement free and not using your, uh, not sharing your data, et cetera. Um, but it became this, art, this artist platform because uh, actually because it failed a little bit, it becomes sort of an alternative to Facebook, um, but it, but artists found their home there. So um, they started to, uh, you know, basically putting their paintings there. I, I, I posted paintings and, and photographs and the stuff I did on it and it was sort of like um uh, you know like it was just artists and uh which made it really nice because you could be inspired by others and uh et cetera, et cetera. um and you weren't kind of to your point first of all you didn't have the feeling like you know you're giving away all your stuff to this corporation that you don't really trust mm -hmm. and um and it was an environment where you uh, felt sort of uh amongst peers and and i think all the other platforms feel more i don't know it's just there's no place for art in a way um unfortunately they closed down so it didn't work uh, for them they kind of ran out of money yeah nowadays um, artists do have to play the social media game is essential they do have to have that yeah. nick and is contradictory most of the times because usually artists are people who are retrieved in their studio who might be more introverted not exactly. everybody is like that but the very nature of of creating and having all of these ideas might push you a little bit away from society or isolate you a little yeah. bit so it's a normal thing that happens with with artists and some creatives you get a little bit like pushed aside mm -hmm. yeah well i think so yeah um which so there so having sort of impact as artists um um you know be, basically uh because you your art might you know is sort of this sort of it informs society it kind of gives a a, a different voice it, it or or it gives comment on on but the on, question is should artists be the ones who should be yeah. doing this or other people should be doing this for the artists mm. Because a lot of this work has fallen in our hands, no, as artists, uh, the promotion, writing text, right. making yeah. explanation, all of these uh, things that come parallel to the works that you do and the exhibitions that you have, it's a lot. And artists didn't used to have this responsibility before. Mm. So now it's much more than just having a craft or having a practice. Mm. Is playing that game and and being successful at that game which is the reputation game which is the attention game which yeah. is the whatever you want to call it no and if you don't play that game it's very difficult for you there is a percentage and, I, and in this uh, paper that i wrote that i'll share uh, i talk about some studies that define uh, the conditions of success in art that has nothing to do with the practice itself but it's just about a network of connections essentially and that's what they yeah. discover and there's two studies about that that i mentioned uh, there are different studies but there is yeah i mean there's a lot of questions of on why uh, art becomes art in that sense, or what what makes someone get to that point where they get these exhibitions? Another interesting finding would be, for example, that we don't celebrate young artists 
Uh, mm. We you don't rarely see young artists uh, being awarded in in a major thing or being exhibited at museums. They always have to be either super yeah. old or dead, no. And why do we attribute this this condition to masters by age? Like it takes time to master the craft, but but really, you know, young artists cannot be artists anymore because life has changed and the conditions of the world has changed. Before you could live out of a part-time job in London and and do art on the side and finance your art yourself, yes, you lived in a very precarious situation probably, but you could do that. And I don't think today you can live out of a part-time job and then do art on the side. I don't think you can do half of the things that that before you could do in terms of of capacity or or finances but also with time and the requirements to for you to be a person in this world, you know, having a profile, having a, a social media and all of these things. So you, in a way, exist in the world. And for artists, that is very counterintuitive because we're not supposed to, 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 to be influencers. We are not supposed to have that influence because when we are given the influence, then we lose the artist power, no? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a point in being a no one too. There's a value in being a no one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, interesting. I, I keep thinking of uh, Andy Warhol in this conversation about this 15 minutes of fame and how in his time <laughs> and, and talk about entertainment. I mean, he was an, he was an entertainer as well as an artist artist or designer this is a good one exactly yeah mm-hmm. right so if you would have yeah if you would have asked him happy um, businessman is what he was yeah yeah at, as, <laughs> at the same time a yeah true but a, influencer yeah and a true yeah. influencer so he was a great yeah so every time you know, in this conversation it kind of pops up in my head like you know this is like uh what would he have done now with social media being what it is now it's would he have survived would could you have i think been, he would thrive yeah, yeah. Right? then he might get canceled too. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but then that would have worked. And he for would him be really like, well. I predicted this all along. I think, yeah, yeah. I can see that. <laughs> yeah. So, are there any examples or, or people that you are inspired by? Who are the artists that you go, like, oh, these are the, my. I honestly wouldn't be able to say. I have a lot of different influences, but also it depends on the period of my life. Mm-hmm. When I think about artists, a lot of of what I enjoy the most is mainly like modern art. So from the vanguards, but of course there's a lot of wonderful and amazing um, works made in the contemporary context. It's just, you have to pick and choose a bit more, I guess. Um, But more than mentioning particular or names of artists, I would rather say that my major influence is not art and perhaps that's why i struggle to connect with the art world a little bit but i don't use art to inspire my art i use the real world to inspire my art i use uh, other fictional words worlds created maybe yes that's also art we can say Mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily yeah i mean I, i don't necessarily look for inspiration within the arts i look for inspiration elsewhere um and yeah, that's what I that's what I would say. I would insist on that the most. I would I would guess. Um, but I think that's good. I I no I, I, I there, there was a um a photographer I um I spoke to uh, quite a few years ago and um and I I so my one of my first jobs was being a photographer because I wanted to because I didn't want to be my my grandfather being a painter and an artist and uh, and uh, so and my father was more like an amateur photographer but he but very um um very good at that and and uh, anyway so I, I was a photographer and for a while and I, st- I, sp- I spoke to this uh, photographer and uh, he said you know um um you don't look <laughs> one of his advice to me was don't look at other photographers work <laughs> don't look at the work just don't look at the work because if you do everything's done you know, you'll go like, oh, they're so much better or, oh, it's already done. It's like, and it will kind of, you know, it will mess you up. Just do you and don't look at the others, you know, be inspired by other things. And, uh, right. Be- and then, and then you develop your own style. Just that will happen. And the other thing, uh, as some other artist told me, which I also remembered, um, someone else, 
uh, he was a, he was a, he was a painter and he said, um, um, just keep doing you don't, don't listen to anyone because there's like, especially nowadays with this kind of, you know, global kind of economy, this world where everything is connected, there is an audience for you. You, mm -hmm. they will find you. You just have to keep going. There are so many people out there. There are billions. There is an audience for you. Don't listen to anyone. Just go do you. So mm -hmm. those two are the two things I, 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 uh, I always like, I, I hear myself repeating to myself, like, don't listen to anyone. You know, don't I can put it like this, you know, I can learn from other artists, but I not necessarily, f the inspiration, I find it somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can learn a lot from, from, from art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And totally. from other artists, techniques, styles. Yeah. There is something to, to obviously uh, of great value and whatnot. But when it comes to, to the things that I want to do, I never really look at, oh, what other artworks have been done in this subject or in this medium. It's more about how can, uh, let's dive, dive deep in the subject and find the perfect method form to, to, to deliver it somehow. Yeah. But but it too, I think it's not just for art, it's also for, for design. And as a designer, I mean, for me, I don't, you know, especially, you know, in the world of like service design and design thinking and all that, I never read any books about service design or design thinking. I like books about behavioral science and, uh, you know, or a totally different things that are totally disconnected from what we call the bubble of service design because, you you know, everything is connected somehow. And, uh, and and you get inspired by so many things. And it's actually so much more interesting to be a little bit outside of the bubble looking in than being in the bubble. Because then you don't see who you are. You don't see, you don't understand where you are. You only see where you are when you're outside. You're like, ah, oh, exactly. this is where it's I came from. It's about perspective. Yeah. And, and in a way, uh, uh, linking back uh, also to obviously your, your, where you're from, uh, Mexico, uh, and you know when before we started recording you talked about uh, you know going back to mexico and, and you know loving it more and more and more the more you go back but i think it's also important because if you don't you think that you got to know Mexi mexico a lot better by moving to london by saying hey this is where i'm from because you're like huh it, and it's, i think you'll if you travel, you know way more about where you're from and the value of where you actually were raised, and, and right, so you see better where you are. Exactly, you know where I where I'm from, Mexico, and then moving to London, it was a massive cultural shock for me. I had no idea. I thought I had it all together. I thought I had it nailed down. I was ready. Had my uh, windbreaker. You know, my <laughs> umbrella ready. And I thought I was going to come and take over the world. And of course not. And a lot of that played in in the fact that I didn't, I wasn't expecting it to be culturally so different in terms of how people relate to each other, or how they uh, behave with each other and many other things and how the weather is so influential because I come from Mexico City and particularly the city it doesn't really have any uh, seasons per se sometimes it's a bit colder sometimes it's a bit warmer but really you use almost like basically the same clothes all year you throw a jacket on and that's it uh, so there's so many different things that I had no idea that I was going to experience that I came here and and it was a huge uh, shock and I had to adjust a lot of things of of the way that I am to to properly exist uh, in the UK and yeah there were a lot of misunderstandings like for example me trying to be kind or trying to speak to people that I don't know and what what not and I realized over time that in England people that are kind are seen as suspicious. There's something to be suspicious yeah. about if you're being too nice or smiley to me. Why are you smiling to me? Why yeah, are what you, you want talking me? to me? <laughs> and <laughs> it's something that it took me ages to realize. Like I thought, I think that people don't like me, you know, but I'm being super nice. <laughs> and the more the nicest that I was, the more people disliked me because they thought I was not genuine. And it took a while for them to realize, no, she's like that with everyone even with a security guy at the supermarket or whatnot, I always, I have always been like this. And as in the same measurement as the choice that I made about my practice, 
I chose not to change myself too much and to mm-hmm. keep on being myself, even if if people misunderstand me a little bit. Obviously, there are some some measurements of moderation and whatnot, but there is two personas, no? The persona that I am in Mexico is not necessarily the same persona that I am here. And probably in other contexts would be would be different too. So you do change a little bit of where you are and and the experiences that you have. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Same. I mean, Morgan, you obviously you you've uh, experienced sim- similar. Uh... Definitely, definitely. Yeah, and and I also wondered if it was a bit of a were you in Mexico City city or were you like because somebody because I I come from like a smaller town in Ohio, in the middle of the United States, right? We're not a big thriving city city. So then when I moved to the big city and there's sidewalks, you know, of course. <laughs> there's <never> sidewalks. <laughs> um, you know, and because of course, like, as you're saying about the kindness, like I can definitely uh, relate to that. Um, you know, in, in, Ohio, in the town that I'm from, you'd, you'd say hello to everyone that you pass on the street. And when people just looked at me strange, I was like, oh, did I do something wrong? And um, but so do you think it's a big city thing or do you think it's, uh, like a cultural It's thing? an absolutely big city thing. Uh, people naturally get alienated. The more people there are in a space, the least you can make connection with all of them. So you, uh, cities are natural alienators, I think of people. Uh, so definitely the city plays a major role. I've been to other places in England and it's not like that. Okay. But of course, there is a part of it that culturally, uh, the personality and and the the manners, the forms, the behaviors of a Mexican and the British are completely different, no? Uh, um, and and despite the fact that the cities is culprit prob- probably for the kindness part, we do uh, have more tact with people. Like we even like touching people and things like that is very common in our culture you know, like from hugs or just in the shoulder while you're speaking to someone or whatnot. Those kind of like little things that make you feel maybe more comfortable with someone or to make someone more comfortable or be more inviting in this context, in the British context, is the contrary. You make someone uncomfortable by doing that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So there is a difference in culture for sure, but we have to of course, put uh, first and foremost the the city phenomena that, of course, plays a big role in London. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Arna, sure. you also lived, did you live abroad for a short while? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, uh, but it, yeah, <laughs> in did Nor- you live, Norway. Did you, did you live abroad long enough to experience that or it was more just kind of like a like an exchange yeah. oh new new uh new atmosphere and then you just came no out. no i no no i noticed no the cultural difference between uh norwegians and the dutch uh yeah totally yeah okay. very okay. very different very different i mean um yeah norwegians are uh so it says very, you, uh, hmm? sorry my brain is just going everywhere norwegians, yeah, go. what <laughs> no 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 it's just that uh, i mean um uh, uh the the um, the Swedish people have a saying about the Norwegians that for in Norway there's a mountain there's one mountain for each Norwegian <laughs> uh, which is true by the way there's there's an equal amount of mountains as there are people and uh, so they're keep it that you know, way <laughs> <laughs> so I never made any Norwegian friends uh, I met a lot of uh, people from other countries and made great friends uh, with them mm-hmm. but uh, I, I made one Norwegian friend by the way one because uh and once you get to become a friend you're a friend forever and ever and ever but there is this, it's very difficult to become you'll always be the outsider you'll always be the foreigner you always be even if you're from an, another valley you're the person from that other valley you'll never be you know this sort of part of their group or of, mm, of, of, you know sure. insiders yeah yeah mm. uh, so if so tis and i guess well, yeah, I guess tis. Um, if you were to move back to Mexico, what would be something from the the British tis that you would bring back and incorporate into your personality? Well, that's a great question, and I'm definitely gonna ponder upon the the answer. 
uh, much longer than now, but <laughs> like, there's know. a lot of things that I find fascinating about the British. And here in London, uh, there's a lot of social norms that are not written, that are not enforced, mm. yet they're followed. And I think that is outstanding because Mexico has a level of chaos that I cannot even imagine something like that being possible. Like on the electric uh, stairs, people push to, to one side or the other, either they're standing or they're walking up. So they allow space mm. for people who want to walk and right. move faster to go. And that would never happen in Mexico. Never, for example. And it's a social norm. No one yeah, exactly. said that that should happen. People just turn out yeah. to be that way. Yeah, somehow. you stand on the right so people can pass on the left. Yeah. yeah. So it's a few things are confusing in, in, in London. Uh, I, I'm there quite often and, and on the sidewalk um, because in the traffic, they drive on the on left the side. side. Mm -hmm. which is the, the wrong side, obviously, but anyway. <laughs> um, so they drive on the left side. And then, but on, on the sidewalk, I never know. Or because I'm like, then you do walk that way too, right? You pass each other. You know, if you have people coming uh, towards you, they will walk on the left, but they don't always. So that's confusing me. But on the, in the escalators, or when you go to the to the, to the, to the, um, to the tube, to the metro mm -hmm. stations and stuff like that, do you, you stand on the right, which is amazing. Um, yeah, the Dutch do that too. So I do kind of expect it a little bit, uh, not as much as the British do because there are more, they, uh, more rules. They, <laughs> they know, I don't know how they do that, but they, they exactly to your point, they have all these kind of, um, the end of these, these kind of things that you're like, that's really nice. They stand in, in line and it's, yeah. It's the amazing. collective understanding of things was what amazed me, you know, because it just happened. And in Mexico, things not just happen like that. Like people yeah. don't get organized like that. Yeah. Uh, but you and, do need some chaos to be creative, right? So. I mean, yeah, I thrive in the chaos, but exactly. it is, yeah, Mexico City is a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, were you practicing art in Mexico before you moved to London? Yeah, absolutely. So I was with this uh, Javier Gomez Soto with with this painter for many many years, going mm. uh, going to his studio and learning techniques. Uh, eventually, I when I became a teenager, I that's when I started exploring, and my curiosity got the better of me, and and I I needed to 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 do other things. I needed to see what else I could potentially do, and that's when I started exploring a lot of mediums as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but by that time, I started functioning as an artist, quote unquote, and looking for exhibitions, looking for opportunities and little things like that uh, as a young adult. And I started having uh, little moments in Mexico where I could show my work or collaborate with other people. So I was already doing that. Uh, and then I went to university and, and when I graduated my BA. Uh, I continue doing doing art, and at some point I decided that because I never studied art or anything like that, other than just going to the to the studio with with Javier. So I thought that maybe I wanted to 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 explore that contemporary art, to explore what the art is new. And then I did a master's in fine arts in uh, in Goldsmiths the, in London. So that's why I moved to the UK and to Europe as a whole. And I've been here ever since, and I've been practicing uh, many different uh, ways to do art. And there is a question sometimes if what I do is art, uh, because I do raise that question sometimes, not only because it just doesn't uh, get identified in what art is, like in the circles of art, it doesn't get identified as art. So the people who are in the art world don't see it as art sometimes or don't consider it art which obviously plays an important role because they are the ones who are defining what art is mm -hmm. uh, but also because it just doesn't follow the normal roles and for example people in the art world they hate to interact no they don't like interactive works too much uh, i had to learn that by force because how can i even imagine that people don't like to interact they just like to sit and watch or, or be a, a, a passive spectators. But funny enough, the interactive aspects of my work and the playful aspects of my work are very effective in connecting with people. 
but it's not effective at all in connecting with the people in the arts. Yeah. Uh, and it's a funny dichotomy. So sometimes I have had this conversation in my head many times thinking, am I an artist? What I do is really art. I'm okay with the idea that it is not. Just to say that. I'm okay realizing years, years after that I am in the end not an artist and what I'm doing is not art. To me, it's much more important to continue to do and to follow that intuition that I spoke about in the beginning in the things that I do and what I live by every day than defining myself as an artist. Mm. And sometimes I feel like it might even play against me to be an artist. You know, defining something as art or as not art, you, the, when you do something with the intent of art, it makes it art. And that's really what it is. Unless someone else validates it, we can say there's two ways. So you're someone of a stake validates it as art and say, yes, this is art and that's how it becomes art. Or you say, this is art. I'm going to do this and this is going to be art. And that's how it is. So why a banana on the wall? When does a banana pasted on a wall becomes art and when it's just trash? And it's all, all about a perception of saying, because I added this value of art, either as an artist, creator, or as an individual, you add this value and you say it's art, and then that's why it becomes that. Mm -hmm. uh, for the better or for the worst, really. It can open conversations, but it also, in some way, it does lose respect, which is what, what has happened, I think, in, in the last decades with art, is that people stopped uh, having an affection or a relationship with art because they stopped understanding it because they they're not speaking to the people anymore or they're not and somehow because artists they don't need to create things that speak to people but somehow it's disconnected now yeah yeah that's and i'm thinking a lot of food for thought i would yeah, say yeah, but yeah, these yeah. are uh, thoughts no there's no definition and we can even uh, go as far to say that art doesn't really exist we yeah. create it as humans. It's an in human invention and it's going to be whatever we say it is. And if you yeah. think about the performance measurements, it doesn't, you're never going to find one single minimal performance measurement other than mm -hmm. someone saying that it's art of, of an institution that is validated. Other than that, there's nothing anymore. So it really, it's an opportunity to redefine art if we take it or or we're just going to let it just fade away somehow. Yeah, and I'm thinking, and Marcel Duchamp is one of my favorite artists, but he's famous for many things, but one of them being challenging, like the old school notion of, you know, and that was back when they would have these grand art fairs and say, oh, this is, this is a piece of art because they meet XYZ criteria. And they got fed up with it. And Marcel Duchamp was one of the people like on the scene that kind of pushed back and said, well, who gets to decide what is art and what is not art? And yeah. then of course, that's why we now have urinals worth thousands and thousands and thousands of euros. <laughs> we could say that Duchamp is the beginning and the, the end of art yeah. Yeah. more than anything else. Because I, 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 when yeah. he opened the door, yeah, yeah. well, not him, no, but the movements that, especially the Dadaist movement, but other movements as well that were taking place in that area, at that moment when they decided anything can be art mm -hmm. and when they break all, all these parameters that people have been constructed, because this always happens, no, o sea, this is art. This is how art it should be. And then it comes and breaks it and breaks it and breaks it. But what happens when you break it completely? Mm -hmm. You know, there, you, the, the meaning and the purpose of art was dismantled completely a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Either... And you might say, rightly so. No, we needed to dismantle every definition of art throughout time to create the next thing. No, we need to be constantly dismantling it. But what happens when you put at an end to that? No, when you go to the infinity on that, that that's kind of what Duchamp did. Mm -hmm. He went to the thought in an infinitive way. And then you close down all the possibilities of perhaps what it could be. Mm -hmm. And then after that is the rise of contemporary art conceptual art, all of these new versions of art that accept uh, art is not having a technical skill, perhaps, or accept other forms of art, which brought us really interesting things, but also a little bit of a of, mm -hmm. of, of a misunderstanding or, or, or a glitch 
yeah. in the in the system somehow and we really haven't evolved too much from that uh, that that current but you're a breaker so <laughs> this must be great for you <laughs> well <laughs> yeah i mean i've been trying to break it but i am not really in the in the in the sec <laughs> in the section sec in the art sector i would say I am, uh, and I have operated within there, but I have no stake on it, or, or you know. <laughs> and I feel uh -huh. like, I feel like the revolution of art is not going to come within. No, I, it comes mm. from people. Like that's you. what I was, and that's what I was just thinking because um, some of some of the work that I do is in like systemic design, so really looking at big systems and how they're all connected and everything, and to change one system to another. Of course, Arna, you're also very familiar with this, right? Like it takes so much effort and so much work and change is just uncomfortable and ugly and you have to look at yourself in the mirror and it's just not always the best of times. And so there's change through breaking. And so I even wrote down on my notes, like the art of breaking, like I have, there's something called engineering and it's really looking at the art of ending yeah. things. Mm is fascinating right but then yeah. if you also have the art of breaking and and as you said it's that is not going to come from within so it almost has to be like an external disruptor or a new island that's built up out of nothing and says hey come join us on this island we're going to yeah you well, that's what i believe because in my experience uh, operating in the art world and the art industry throughout all these years i don't see any intention of change at all you would think, as you, as I say, I, as I said before, like you think that it's a very liberal place where everybody's yeah. accepted, inclusive. You, it it's felt not, like it's the contrary it of that. Nice. No, it becomes something very restrictive and elitist and separatist and exclusive and whatnot. So there's a lot of things we really also need to question that. I sometimes also don't want to call myself an artist or where I do art because I'm not sure if, yeah, if I want to be point. related to those values. Those are not the values that I stand by. And I don't think that's the meaning of art, but it cares about what my definition of art is. You know, mm -hmm. it's mine and that's great, but the rest of the world doesn't care, right? So if that's what art means to everybody else, or that's what people think about art and artists in the rest of the world, then I am not sure if that's what I want to be associated with, neither. If we made you the mayor of New Art Island, how would you define art? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> easy question. <laughs> I'm, I might just kill it as a concept Ooh, i don't know i don't know it's an interesting question but i feel like it carries so much negative things even if you think about it back in history of course the modernist and, and the vanguards that broke everything it was an amazing time in in arts but it has always been related to patronage it has always been related with the with the powers with aristocracy with this mm -hmm. merit of, oh, I'm a genius, so I can do whatever I want or behave whatever I want, the secretism. There's a few things that I'm not sure if 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 maybe a, an approach would be different in terms of thinking more about makers and creatives and 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 labels like that rather than saying artists that who the hell knows what that means. Mm. Uh, but it's... You know, I feel like there will be an opportunity. Like, if you think about in a science fiction point of view, no, and let's say that uh, the technological revolution succeeds and we fix all our problems and every and the promise of our utopia is coming, and then everything is automated and run by robots. So we all have all this free time to create and think and do things, for example, and that could be an interesting version of the future that I could potentially imagine if we allow that to happen somehow in some way, we, we would spend most of our time creating and, and, and making information and whatnot. So that would probably be amazing. No? And, and we could redefine what that means at that time. Uh, yes. Because I do feel like, there's people that are more of an artist that are not artists at all. Like, for example, uh, Michelangelo or who, who, 
whoever, no? That artists that I go and see that are selling for millions in the art fair. Mm -hmm. uh, you see them on the streets, you see them everywhere, or you see someone like an artist that could be a designer, could be an artist, who knows, but he does really nice illustrations and the illustrations become viral and he becomes famous and, and, and makes something out of it, no? And is that really what the future could be of art? You know, we have to first define, like, everybody thinks that art has an important place in society. You know? Everybody thinks that culture, uh, cultural makers have a very important place in society and a function. And it's very important for us to, uh, for us to exist and, and, and create uh, our society. You know? But no one also has the idea that then because of that, we have to support the people who create uh, those works. No, no one feels like they have that responsibility to 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 take care of the creatives and the makers, but everybody expects that to exist in their society, almost like as a free thing. Uh, no, you mm. have the idea that culture should be and it's always free and it should be, yes, but then that creates a very precarious uh, precarious situation for for artists. And at the moment, right now, I don't really see. Um, how young artists will be able to survive. Many of my friends that I did an, a master's degree with, they have left the arts. They can either because they are fed up with the system or how it works or uh, or because they just need to live and work uh, to 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 live and and they have to just leave it on the side or or leave it forever, no? And it it's happening a lot that people are no longer able to continue or they are not able to continue for many years because how long how can you live in those conditions and where does it end? Uh, so there might be a deficit in, in artists uh, in the future. Mm. Um, mm. And, and maybe even creatives as a whole because we don't really have that much time anymore to, to, yeah. to make things. Well, it depends a little bit on your and on, on what, what the future will bring. We do, nobody knows, of, obviously. Uh, I hope that technology will set us free and we <laughs> as society need to start creating a different relationship with jobs um, and uh, and life exactly. in general and that um, we take care um, of because if if technology takes over all the jobs which it probably won't but it will take over a lot of them um, and it could. And uh, if we as nations have enough resources to take care of people um, uh, and we we start think, uh, understanding that if people do not have jobs, they still have a meaningful uh, contribution to, to society. Uh, it, you're not defined by work. You're not defined by job. Uh, as in a, you know, because we live in those economies that that kind of tells us that as a truth, you know, if you don't have work, if you don't have, a, if you don't have a job, you're not a really a worthwhile human being, really, um, you know, because uh, and then we need to stimulate you to find a job, so we're not going to give you any, we're going to give you not enough money to live, because otherwise you're just going to be lazy and do watch Netflix all day. And people that's what they say, but would I know you? because they, how many days you can spend watching Netflix I in your know. sofa? I'll do it for a month and then I get <laughs> bored, you know. But seriously, of course not. People don't. We know this. People. There's people that be... would, but I think the majority of people wouldn't because people find things to do. They would do things in their community. Yes. They would do things, you know, exactly. with others. And they and they social will. Things. They want to be meaningful. People want to be our social beings. They want to do social things. They want to connect to people. They want to be meaningful. They want to have a meaningful life. And watching Netflix all day might be meaningful for a while. But it's really not. So the point is that I think that um, you know, if we have build a society, a utopia, <laughs> obviously, but still not you know, an utopian society where we um, you know, in in a way, set us free, which has been happening uh, you know throughout history anyway. We got more free time to go on vacations, to contemplate, to reflect on life, et cetera, et cetera. But if we can kind of distance ourselves from this idea that you need to work to be meaningful, that if you have, there's like an, uh, like a, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's like an, an income for everyone. So you can always live and you mm -hmm. will be meaningful and you will create meaning for people. I think this is where we'll see a lot of new artists 
flourish all of a sudden. And not because they're going to be millionaires or billionaires because they made this art. Because that's the other thing, the money part of it makes it so corrupt. You got your uh, necessities covered and then yeah. you can create. No, I so will... you cannot create when you're worried about how you're going to pay the rent exactly. or what you're going to eat. You need to to have your needs met and that's when you get creative. But there's also a, 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 an opinion that would say that it's systemic for us not to have these spaces to to or to have the time and space to create and wonder too much because you say yes we have more time or we can go on vacations and whatnot but really where is our our mind or our attention and sure for sure yeah no no especially it can be a threat to the structure no and Mm -hmm. when you think about like if i imagine this world this utopia I imagine that if it exists, it's going to come with a a massive sacrifice from all of us. We're going to have to leave a lot of things that we love, a lot of, Mm. we're going to have to completely change the way we, we behave every day and the things that we consume and how we live. And that could be tricky. Well, for sure. Tricky. Yeah. That's (laughs) an understatement. (laughs) It's going to be tricky. I don't see the utopia necessarily as a very positive thing but maybe the utopia has to do with Uh, also like this sacrifice part of saying like no we cannot have everything yeah but i think that because that's sort of something we 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 kind of um tell ourselves uh we lie to ourselves when we say we need everything um Mm -hmm. we don't need everything we we only we actually need not that much we need not that much really (laughs) um tis um I I love talking to you. I love this topic. I you know as you can tell because we've been talking for a very long time, um, <laughs> and we want people to get actually to reach the end of this podcast. And I, I and this is such an important uh, and close to my heart topic. And I really like the way you're thinking about this. And uh, and uh, you know I, I I think we you know we need people like you to change that, whatever mm-hmm. that is, what we call art whatever that that is but we need people like you we need to out it's going to be the outsiders out people outside of the bubble um you know and uh you know and then we have to be aware that you don't become the bubble afterwards <laughs> you know like before you know it um because that it that happens can t- well yeah it does yeah yeah you're yeah. gonna see me in 20 years uh, you know having selling my work for millions yeah and yeah, yeah exactly being in all the fancy parties and then you're gonna see me on the streets and say hello and i'll be like who are you who are you you know <laughs> you say i thought you were you were against this thing you're like ah oh, you know um you don't know um yeah um yeah the we, future well, will tell i the future will tell i i i hope for you that uh, some of that will become true especially uh, the the parties and uh, and, and uh, <laughs> being able to live um uh, and a, a wealthy and healthy life uh and and um with your art so i think that be uh, yeah be really cool anyway so um yeah thank you so much for this conversation um i i, I yeah again i could have talked to you <laughs> way more yeah thanks yeah, for uh, inspiring us thank dude. you yeah, my my, my my brain hurt, hurts now. Now I'm gonna lie awake <laughs> at night and go like, yeah, this is. We have to solve this. I don't know. Do we? No, we do not. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, do uh, we need to do anything? No, we do don't we need not? to. Do I? Yeah. Do I have to do something? No, no, I don't. You know, no, no. Let it go. <laughs> let it go. Just do, do your, do you, do you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you.